technology. Uh, uh, oh, this is this is the UK, so I have to dial a lot of I have to dial a lot of numbers because it's the UK. Because I'm in I'm in America. Okay, it's ringing. Your call has been forwarded to an automatic voice message system. Matt Horn is not available. At the tone, please record your message. When you have finished recording, you may hang up or press 1 for more options. Matt, Matt Horn, David Kay. I'm calling from Los Angeles, California. You know, David Kay, the voice of... Call back, man. I'm I'm good to go. Let's do this thing. On the line, we have David K talking to us. From where are you talking to us, from David? I'm talking to you from my uh, studio in Los Angeles, California, in the beautiful uh, neighborhood of Toluca Lake. It's in the valley. Uh, we're close to Universal Studios and uh, not too far from Warner Brothers and the Warner Brothers, uh, the famous Warner Brothers Ranch. So we're in the little pocket here. <laughs> Is it currently locked down? I had a tough time on the first week, first week and a half, I'd say, sleeping, figuring out, like, like, anxiety, like, all the stuff. Yet again, we are talking about COVID-19. COVID-19, which is obviously the elephant in the room. What's it been like for you with this whole crisis? My concern is we're, we're opening up too soon. They're allowing some states, I guess, like Michigan, I heard this morning, is allowing up to 10 people to get together. I've been ordering groceries, and we've been, you know, very seldom going out. I'm just worried it's all too soon. I think we're in this for a while. I think we just got to be real careful. I'm putting stock and faith in science and our medical community. Someone will will find a way. Because the good news is the whole world's working on it, right? Mm. There are some good things that, that happen, that will happen. We don't know what those are yet. But in the process of trying to find a a workaround or antivirals or vaccines, they're going to find some other stuff, too, that's going to be, you know, beneficial. I know that there's there's pockets of good stuff happening out there that we just don't know yet. So, you know, we'll see. Uh, the good news is in the voiceover world, we're still kind of cranking away. Mm. And that's exciting. We're still doing we're still doing animation. We're still doing video games. Uh, there's a lot of commercials, a lot of projects coming through. So uh, that's that's good. You know, I, I'm very very for, fortunate to have this studio and working away. Mm. Do you think that when this is all over, production companies are going to utilize home studios a lot more? Well, they already are. Here's here's the thing. I remember um, saying, "Hey, my agents," I, I'd say, "You know, I'm going to be going away. We're going to be going somewhere, and I'm not going to be available." And I mean, I've had the studio for years. I've had a, a studio in, in my in my house for like for years. But now there's sort of no excuse to to say, "Well, I'm going to be in New York next week." Oh, no problem. We'll just do it from your uh, your rig, or we'll just do it. Now they're going to know it works. <laughs> <laughs> so, so the good news is. They can do it. The bad news is you're going to be even less off the grid. So in order to take a holiday or take a break, it's going to be difficult. We have Memorial Day weekend this weekend, and Monday's a holiday, but I'm not even going to ask my agents to say, hey, I'm not available, because right now it's like 24-7. If you're available, you have to be sort of available, right? Mm. I mean, I live very close in in this community here. Any of your uh, older listeners might remember Bob Hope. Or Bing Crosby, way back in the 40s. Well, Bing Crosby used to live right behind me, like years ago. And this is this is a company town, so everybody you meet out there is uh, either below the line or above the line. I run into Andy Garcia all the time. Well, not now. I'd stay six feet away if I do see. And uh, I was delivering a box. Uh, I was setting off one of these buttons. Uh, no, side uh, buttons. Yes, buttons um, at the post office. And uh, it was creepy to go in the post office because I was wearing a mask. Uh, and one guy beside me, uh, we just struck up a conversation. And uh, he works at Warner Brothers, and they've been treating their, their people pretty well. But there's a ton of people on camera out of work. And so you're going to find that when the things start to come back, instead of like 20 guys or 20 women uh, you know, doing lighting, you're going to have like two people. Instead of like a whole crew, you're going to have, you know, instead of 100 people, there might be 10. That's going to change how things are done. It's going to be more expensive. It, it, it's scary, and no one knows and it's an anxious time, but it's going to be interesting and fascinating to see what comes out of all this. 
Mm. That's my long. That's my long answer. <laughs> Are you fully stocked up? That's the funny question. I went shopping this morning actually to get a few things. Uh, I've developed a, a bit of a habit. I have these routines now. I'm becoming this uh, uh, like, like a Howie Mandel, you know, like a germaphobe. And I have routines. I can't go to bed unless I okay shower. Then I have to do this, and the brush your teeth. Then I do the then the thing. Then I got to put the mint uh, on my hands and breathe it in. Then I can now I can go to bed. And I put the lip balm on when I have to go out for for groceries. The mask, of course, and I wear the gloves. I come home, close off into the washer, turn the washer on, shower, blah blah blah, and then I can relax. I never used to do this. Mocha, you know, like mochas, chocolate almond milk, and coffee. I have to have that in the morning, and I have to sit outside. I pick a little different spot in my yard somewhere, a different perspective, and I and if I don't have that, I feel off. Mm. It's strange. I have these things now. I'm becoming my father in a real hurry. Chocolate, almond milk, and coffee. Trust me, it's it's really really good. Obviously, we're here to talk about your career, which yes is massive. When I looked at it, I thought, where on earth can I start with this? And I thought, let's go back to when Matt was a teen. Makes sense. I think one of the games I do remember quite fondly, and it obviously it spawned this massive franchise from it, was Ratchet and Clank. Mm-hmm. Yes, of course. I remember Clank. I remember the first audition. I was living in Vancouver in the studio. I had built a studio in the basement. Uh, I had a great little space I was commuting to Los Angeles at that time uh, on a regular basis, like a lot. It was 10 years in, in airplanes from Vancouver to L.A., Vancouver to L.A., back and forth. I remember I remember a fax came through, FAX, remember those? My agent said it's a video game, like uh, video games I remember growing up with uh, the sound effects were like, oh, eh, ah, oh, body, body blow, bo- 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 body blow. That was what I remember. And this was more like a cartoon. And there was a paragraph, it's a robot. He has to have a personality. I mean, it was a, just a couple lines of dialogue, and I'm like, I don't know. So I record on, I don't know what I was recording on at that time, maybe a dat tape or, I have no idea. But I just started talking like this. Instead of saying can't, I would say cannot. My neck was actually sore after the audition because my head was kind of going back and forth. And I sent it in and forgot all about it. A few weeks later, my agent called and said, hey, good news. Uh, so they want to hire you for the role of Clank. Okay, I didn't even remember what the hell it was that I read for, and uh, she had to refresh my memory. And I remember the first session, the first few sessions we did at Warner Brothers, like on the on the studio lot. And so here's this kid, you know, from uh, from uh, Canada. Um, uh, we're in the process of emigrating at the time, and and, and uh, I was mostly down here by myself and going back and forth. And you're walking on the studio lot on Warner Brothers, and you're like, oh boy, ain't this something? Look at me, Mama Star. Oh, hello, Conan O'Brien. Oh, uh, hello, famous movie star. You know, they're all walking around, and it's beautiful over there. And uh, I'm in the studio on this big sound stage, and first time I had an opportunity or the experience of having people inside the booth. They're not behind the glass. There's people behind the glass, the engineer, and this other couple of people. But there were the directors and the, and the, on the audio dire- voice directors and the game creators are in the room with you. So you're in there, and it was really uncomfortable. And I had to get used to that. But I remember the first session thinking, well, this is this is a video game? This is cool. And I think, what, are we 18 years now out from that? And uh, I'm really crossing my fingers that um, I'm, I'm, sh- I, I'm sure there'd probably be another game. There's no indication that there wouldn't be. But um, I'm anxious to get uh, to get back on, on it again and, and do more. But, yeah, who'd ever thought? From that little character there. Uh, that me and James Arnold Taylor would be uh, still doing it. Well, funny enough, you mentioned him, actually. I was going to mention him just now. And uh, I've met him. I've actually interviewed him. This was, like, ages ago, like yeah. like about 10 years ago. Such a great guy. Him and I did a USO tour. Uh, we went to the, the, the base, to uh, Vandenberg Air Force Base, which is north of Los Angeles here, uh, north of Santa Barbara on the coast. That's where, they, that's where the space program started. That's where they launched some of the rockets. SpaceX went out of there. So we got a chance to tour the base, and, and James... Uh, I spent a whole day with him up there, and uh, just the nicest guy. He gives everybody his time and equal attention, and uh, he's a great dude. Mm. I can only think of Ratchet and Clank at the minute as, as being the duo of gaming, if that makes sense. Uh-huh. There's not many. I mean, Mario and Luigi are all voiced by Charles Martinet, obviously. I can't think of any other gaming duos that are obviously in the title of the game. <laughs> so. Yeah. 
what do you think it is about the two of you that works so well? I'm going to say it's a second marriage, you know. We're both very, you know, we're both obviously different people. I mean, I'm the tall one, and he's, uh, I don't want to say that. <laughs> people see us and go, wait a minute, you're Clank? It's a, it's, a, it's a marriage of sorts, and we've been doing it a long time. We're both very, very well aware and thankful that we've been given this opportunity to do something we love and to you know, be voices on a video game. I mean, my God, that's, that's pretty cool. It's a chemistry, I guess. It just clicks. It just works. And we do a lot of stuff on our own. When we did the movie, actually, it was kind of fun because we got to be in the studio at the same time because normally we're in there separately. So we're playing off the direction of... Uh, the voice director behind the glass and, and, and the writers and creators uh, and you have you know you have to uh, pretend that somebody else is talking to you and, and uh, give those lines uh, their proper read it's been so long we just know you know how each other is as a sort of a franchise itself why do you think it's so popular I think the creatures and the characters and the weapons are so cool I remember going to insomniac games and I went in there and they have like big giant models of the of the actual weapons and I remember hey that's that that's the blaster thing and i picked it up and it's an actual it's a big prop and it's 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 amazing i mean i've known those people over there ted uh ted price for a long time i do have to ask this question obviously you've got no control whatsoever i know where would you like to see the franchise go i'd love to do a second film i know the budget wasn't there for the first one and and also there's so much there's so much story my concern about the first one is this is so much stuff. How do you take all that stuff and put it into one film? One of my favorite characters is Dr. Nefarious and Armin Shimmerman, of course, he's amazing. I don't know how he doesn't like ruin his throat every time he works. As far as the game, I mean, gosh, I don't know. I'd like to be able to put on a, a headset, like a you know, a VR and be in there with them. Let's go virtual. Let's go inside. Let's hang out with Ratchet and Clank. That would be fun. See, the question is there. I obviously have to agree with you. That would be a tremendous achievement if they did would you want the player to be this third person watching the two of them or would you want them to play either Ratchet watching Clank or Clank oh, watching Ratchet I'd love to be able to sort of like if I wanted to be a Lombax or a or helper or a plumber or some kind of other character uh, to play along with them to help them out you know I don't know how to design a, design a game <laughs> but that would be kind of fun to help help them along I do have to ask the question, which one's your favourite? <laughs> which game? Yeah. The first one was good because it's the first one. I'm looking at it right now. I have, I have a few of the games up there. The old PS3. Is it the PS3? The PlayStation 2, the very first Ratchet and Clank. It's the first game I'd ever played all the way through. And I remember I stayed up all night long. Never done that before. I went upstairs and woke my wife up at 6.45 in the morning. Hey, hey, hey. What? What? I finished it. Finished what? The game. I finished the game. Why are you bothering me at 6.45? What were you talking about? And I was all ecstatic. And I felt like crap all day because I hadn't slept all night. So that was the last time I did that. It's one of those games that's not sort of violent. It's quite cartoonish. Who doesn't like, you know, firing off a super blaster or something? I'm not putting ideas in yours or James's head. <laughs> yes, you are. You are so. <laughs> <laughs> but have you guys ever considered a Twitch playthrough? Yes, we have, actually. Uh, I'd like to do that. But I don't know, these people really want to see two old guys on Twitch playing Ratchet and Clank. I don't know. The last time we got together for lunch, uh, five months ago, five, six months ago now, that was the conversation. Hey, man, you know, we should play on Twitch. That that came up. Well, obviously, I have to mention the, the two other voiceover artists, I suppose they are. They're more mocap, to be honest, which is obviously Nolan North and Troy Baker, who mm -hmm. obviously have done the playthroughs of uncharted last of us so it, so it yeah, is those popular guys, those guys hmm. are another level on the video game stuff my agent said you sure you don't want to do mocap like i don't know i don't know those guys love it they just love it i i'm so used to going in and doing my little uh you know clank and the other few games i've done and we're doing a psychonauts 2 is coming out i can talk about it's one thing i can talk about that's coming up is the second psychonauts and that's that was a lot of fun to do you see they play games i i don't play i just don't have time that's not my my thing they're gamers, and I know Phil Lamar, I mean, those guys are gamers, and I uh, I just haven't, like I said, that first Ratchet and Clank game, I think is the only game I've ever played all the way through. I did get close on uh, Resistance, uh, the Resistance series from, from Insomniac, uh, to finishing those games, that was kind of fun. But what happens to me is I get down this rabbit hole, and all of a sudden, five hours have gone by, and I'm like, I haven't done anything. 
I'm open to, to getting down with the games again, but I'll, I'll go down a deep hole and it'll be six hours, and that's what I'm concerned about. Nolan North never played Uncharted before, and that took about 12 episodes. <laughs> well, see, there you go. Yeah. You know, yeah, it takes time. I mean, you, you know, you, you agree, agree with me, right? You know, you gotta, you got to invest some time. I'm more afraid of what happens if I start playing games. Mm. Well, I can also tag myself. I say tag myself like I've tagged myself with James Arnold Taylor, the great. I can also tag myself with Ben 10, because we have had Yui Lumenthal on. Oh, yes. Ah, oh, Yuri. There's another class act, man. I've worked with Yuri a lot in different things, but yeah, Yuri is, is, is great. And of course, Insomniac and he's, you know, Spider-Man. And we both had that connection with him over there. Yeah, he's, he's great, man. I mean, what's it like yeah. working on Ben 10? Because that's obviously a more of a kid's show. It was fun. <laughs> I was brought in on Omniverse, and I always wanted to do an ode to my Uncle Terry, you know, being from Canada. He had the accent, eh? Well, I got to play uh, sock squash there, eh? Kind of got to do the thing. And and everybody laughed, and so I was able to, you know, shout out to my uncle. But all the different aliens and things was so much fun, playing Skurd and, and Frankenstrike. And I, I'm looking up at my type of toy, but the Kyber toy up there. I really enjoyed playing Kyber the Huntsman on Omniverse. He was that sort of a South African character down in here. Never got too excited. I'll get you, Ben Tennyson. And I loved playing that character. He was so cool. And then, fast forward, Man of Action uh, took over the franchise. And I felt pretty uncomfortable going in because uh, friend Paul, you know, hiding is my grandpa Max. I mean, I used to watch Ben 10. So they had me read for that. I'm like... Is this okay? It's just the nature of the beast. A new team comes in. And uh, I was fortunate to be able to, to, to be cast as my first grandfather role, my grandpa role. I was excited and, um, and terrified at the same time because it was my first grandpa role. Uh, second, of course, is I saw Paul and once said, hey, man, I'm really sorry. <laughs> but he knows. And I just wanted to do my best uh, with, with the role that I was, I was given. But that was real fun. And it's just, you know, it's my grandpa role. Man. What the Sam Hill band? Where? How in the world, you kids? Uh, it was so fun to play to play Grandpa Max, and you know, again, hoping for uh, for more of those. I think the storyline's still developing too, which is exciting. So I can't tell you anything, <laughs> but yeah, it's fun. And then, of course, we have to talk about the other massive franchise that, that obviously you're associated with, which is Transformers. Ah, <laughs> uh, yes, Transformers. Yes. That's a little little button. Excellent. Way, way back in the olden olden times, we used to go to conventions. They used to sell those uh, sell those buttons. Ninety four. I was very new to the industry. I'd done GI Joe, Exo Squad, and then some other you know a bunch of anime and 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 this whole Transformers thing came around. Remember, I talked about how Ratchet and Clank. I got the audition for that. It was like a paragraph. I grew up on Bugs Bunny and those sort of weird cartoons, Tex Avery and and strange stuff. So I wasn't really aware. And so the, the character breakdown, it was like a big Bible of characters, dialogue, relationships. There's like a stack of papers. I, I don't even remember the first read. Just somehow I got a call back. And I remember the call back. I'm thinking, man, I don't know what to do. And they wanted me to read for both Optimus and Megatron and all the people behind the glass and all the meerkats. You know, they're you know, looking around. So I, I, I'm sitting in there waiting to go in. I go, I don't know. Sort of the last minute I... I I tell this story all the time. Sean Connery and Anthony Hopkins. What if I combine those two with a lizard? Like, how would that sound? And I remember going in and being nervous. And hey, everyone, hi, hey, good to see you guys. Hi, hi. It's okay. Um, let's uh, let's give it a shot. Just give it a run through. So I started with the dialogue, and I just started talking. You know, it was like a Sean Connery lisp. You know, Anthony Hopkins, very very Shakespearean. And I put this voice on, and I sort of developed a bit of a lisp lizard type thing and of course as the show gets going you kind of fall into the role it became this very shakespearean in here in the throat yes excellent and that's what they cast me as i remember reading for optimus but i don't even remember what i did for it it might have been close to the optimus prime i i did in in animated is more of my of my normal voice in that series in 2007 I still hear the first like four or five episodes. I'm like, oh, it's not. Uh. And then I kind of dropped into it where it's mostly my voice, just a, you know, Bumblebee. We have to find Megatron. He was uh, younger sounding in those first few episodes. I was still trying to find out like who I was and who this robot was. Again, it, I guess it made sense. 
But the Megatron character, man, that sort of started the whole thing where I was in radio at the time doing a morning show, and I was part of a morning team. And I was doing crazy characters like Cowboy Dick. Howdy, boys and girls! And doing all these, you know, Danger Boy and Stuntman. And, uh, and I found my calling, and I said, well, how do I quit this and just do that? And that became my goal is to just do voiceover on my own terms and not have to go and do a, like a radio show and sit there for four or five hours and go, oh, okay. Because that was what I was doing. I was going to be a radio person. I was going to go into radio. And then I found this and I went, oh, now this I love. This, this I can hang my hat on. How do I make this work? And, and uh, that was all thanks to Megatron. Once that happened, I went, okay. There's a whole other world here. Now, you know, I started paying attention and went to New York and met all those people and, you know, eventually ended up down here uh, because of uh, because of Transformers. They've been great to me, man, and, and I can't thank them enough. Who would have thought? After that, things started kind of hopping, yeah. Oh, uh, mm. you're Megatron? You know, I mean, that, that would open doors. <laughs> <laughs> At a bar. You're Megatron? Yes, yes, I am Megatron. Uh, <laughs> Do you remember the old radio station that you, you probably don't, Atlantic 252? They were based out of Ireland. I used to do their voice of the station years ago. I had a whole gaggle of stations. I still do in North America and parts of Europe. And I started doing like promos and more commercials. In L.A., I've always wanted to do movie trailers, and, and, and I have a, a great management team, and I've been able to, to do that, and it's just been a dream come true. It's a, for a career, the best move I made was, uh, was coming here to Los Angeles, and uh, I'll mm. start there. Well, obviously, I need to go on about the cons and the conventions, which yeah. I'm guessing that you've been to, <laughs> where people yeah. do cosplay and fan art and ask wonderful questions like, if Megatron and Clank had a conversation, what would it sound like? I fear those questions. Mm. And people ask them because they know I fear those questions. <laughs> Did you want me to do a conversation <laughs> between Megatron and Clank? I was going to say, would you be able to do a conversation with with Clank and with Clank and Megatron about COVID nineteen? I suppose I could. I believe I may have a cure. A cure? I know the cure. The cure is a good dose of oil bath with a rubber duck, if I may. <clears throat> oh no, not that again. Rubber ducky, you're the one. Rubber ducky, so much fun. COVID-19 will be over if we all just wash our hands in oil. Come here, ducky. Oh, dear. I've created a monster. <laughs> I wish I was funnier. <laughs> oh, dear me. <laughs> I think that's sort of made up for no cons whatsoever this year. <laughs> oh, dear. So, obviously, I do have to go on about cosplaying and, and fan art. I imagine that you do get quite a bit. What kind of fan art have you had so far and cosplaying of, of your characters? I still have 12 rubber ducks stashed away. One is in my studio, and I'm looking at it right now. I put one on the shelf. Some of the drawings are amazing. Some of these people should be in, in the industry working, uh, some of the stuff I get. I was in Seattle last year, and this uh, boy and his mom came. He's autistic and, and, a, and a wonderful kid, and, and he, he throws his energy and time into these pieces of art all to do with you know pop culture and Transformers, and I was blown away by how good this stuff was. And there's these little beads. I'm looking at uh, an, a, an animated, an Optimus, a Transformers animated character. It's a, those those beads, you know, you iron together. They're like little colored beads. They're kind of flat with little holes in it. And this person did a an amazing Optimus Prime. Obviously, you go to cons, and the number one question that people ask you is, what advice would you give to anyone wanting to get into the industry? Wow. That always makes me speechless sometimes because it seems to change every every so often. Right now, you've got out-of-work people in the industry that are not in voiceover thinking, hey, maybe I could try voiceover. So now it's even more crowded. See, the thing is, when I asked that question way back, there were people willing to give me some, some information. There's no roadmap. There's no magic you know, potion or whatever. There's no one right thing. You have to really want it to do it. I noticed when I started working and coming to Los Angeles that your audition has to be good enough to go to air. It's having the right representation and getting the representation. Of course, that's a catch-22. So you have to have a demo or you have to know what you're doing. Uh, I'd say you know, improv and, and theater training and all that sort of stuff. Being able to be as natural as you can behind the microphone and using your own voice will get you the gig. 
Because no matter what voice you do, if you're doing a, a, a voice other than your own, that voice has to have a soul and a character and a heart. It has to be real. If you're doing this guy, he's got to have a heart and a soul. He's got to be a real person. He has to have feelings. He's got to be able to cry and laugh. You have to have a life story, just like you have a life story. I suggest reading a ton, and just, of course, when we could travel, I would always say, travel as much as you can. I'm like, oh, boy, well, that's a weird thing to say right now. I was going to ask you, are there any roles that you haven't done yet that you would like to do? Star Wars! Star Wars! But that's too late now. Well, maybe not, because they're doing, oh, my God, The Mandalorian. Have you seen that? Mm. Oh, so good. Oh, so good. It was my first love when I was a kid, you know, went to the movie theater to see those, the first ones. And, and, and fast forward, I worked with Mark Hamill, you know, a bunch of times. So working with Mark was a lot of fun. I worked with him in Avengers, uh, Avengers Assemble and, and some of that uh, the stuff with, with Marvel. I digress because one of my favorite things was to work with Stan Lee and Mark Hamill on the same day in the same room. That was, that was incredible. That was a dream come true. So my love for Star Wars goes way back. I don't care if they make a crappy movie. I'm still watching. I'll still love it. I don't care what anybody says. I don't pay attention. It's just, ah, oh, that's not what. Just to be a character involved in that would be so cool. Yeah. Mm. I mean, I was going to ask, you mentioned about Marvel and the fact that you've done various Marvel projects. Is Jarvis. You do the computer mm-hmm. Jarvis. Yes. How on earth are you not the the voice actor doing Jarvis in the films? I don't get that. I was a much bigger fan of, of, of his. I'm not as good as he is. <laughs> uh, I was just, yes, sir, right away, sir. Incoming, sir. And, and of course, he becomes Vision. And uh, that was just so much fun. I like to have Baron Von Zemo. He died a glorious death. Or did he? I met Stan. He goes, what do you do on the show? And I said, well, right now I'm Jarvis and I, uh, you know, Vision. I play uh, Baron Von Zemo. He goes, oh, give me a, give me a bit of Baron Von Zemo. What, what's he sound like? And, uh. I did this thing here. Mr. Lee, it's a pleasure to meet you, but I must be going. I have to take over the world. What was the question? <laughs> <laughs> How come you're not How am I not? Yeah, yeah, well, motion pictures are a bit different. Uh, David, David who? David what? No, no give, me, give, me a, give me a star. Give me something that can sell a picture. So, obviously, I'm going to give you a one-minute plug. And with that one-minute plug, I want you to obviously tell us a bit about Psychonauts 2. Yeah, I play Fort Cruller. He's kind of, he's a little crazy, uh, but he, he, he's back, and it's Psychonauts 2, and we go deeper and darker. There's a trailer out there right now, you can watch the, the E3 trailer for Psychonauts 2, and you get an idea of what, uh, what you're in for. And I can say it looks fantastic, and the game should be out pretty soon. I've been given the go-ahead to talk about, you know, that I am reprising the role of Ford Kruller, and uh, he's coming back. As far as what the game is like, obviously I can't tell you anything, but it, it looks in, incredibly fun and insanely good, and there's some great people working on it, so I hope you enjoy it. I did do this with James. I'm going to do it with you, I think. I gave him one minute to do as many voices... <laughs> oh, see, he's good at that! <laughs> ...that he has done in his career. And now I'm going to bequeath it to oh, you. Oh, well, wait a minute. Uh, okay. Um, <laughs> gosh, uh, let me let me try let me try. There's Megatron. Yes. Excellent. Predacons, terrorize! Optimus Prime. Bumblebee, we have to find and stop Megatron as quickly as we can. Transform and roll out! Vision from, uh, from, from Avengers Assemble. Uh, right away, sir. Something's wrong, sir. It's not quite working. I did Iron Man a long time ago and basically he talked like this. Ha, <laughs> Tony Stark at your service. Uh, who else? Uh, Bennett Von Simo, like I did before, said take over the world. The giant baby from Reg- Reginald the Giant Baby and regular show. Yes, where is the cake? Clank from Ratchet and Clank. This is Shomaru from, um, from uh, Inuyasha. Jockin. Where are you, Jockin? That is the last time, Jockin. And then, of course, uh, who else is there? Uh, uh, there's um, uh, Kaiba the Huntsman, Ben Tennyson. Frankenstrike? Scud. Yes, my name is Scud. And oh dear, what have we got to do? Uh, Superman. Okay. Bizarro Superman! I'm lost. I don't even know how many there is. Yo, Joe. Quick, follow me toward the danger. Yo, Joe. I mean, that was was him. Grandpa Max from Ben 10. Uh, Trolls, uh, uh, King Peppy. uh, uh, Trolls, the beat goes on from DreamWorks. And King Peppy say like this. Oh, dear. Uh, Well, you're my daughter. I don't care what you do. I'll always love you. (laughs) James is so good. I just realized that just how good he is and how how mediocre. (laughs) Well, I saved the best question for you, which is saved for all 
people who are actors and voiceover artists from Canada. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Which is the best Canadian city, Vancouver or Toronto? Neither of those. Kelowna, British Columbia, has my heart. Kelowna is between the coast and Vancouver and Calgary, Alberta. It's in the middle there in British Columbia. It is uh, wine country. It's uh, mountains. It's skiing in the wintertime, freshwater lakes. It is stunningly beautiful. And my God, I miss not being able to go up there right now. We usually go up and spend uh, some time up there uh, quite a bit. And we can't get to our place because uh, the borders are closed. First thing we're going to do is when we're able to, and when I feel safe, is not fly. We're going to take the Tesla. We're going to drive from here. And we're going to go all the way up through Northern California wine country. We're going to hit in, uh, Oregon wine country and Washington. And we're going to cross the border up into, into Canada near a place called the Soyuz, which is, uh, you know, this is a border between Washington State and, and, and British Columbia. And, and we're going to spend some quality time up there when we're able to. Now, that's the first thing we're going to do. Uh, I, I don't know when that is, but that's what we're going to do. So Kelowna, British Columbia, that's where my, my heart is, and that's mm. my favorite city in Canada. Whoops-a-daisy, I forgot to add Montreal to that question. Montreal. Let me say, Montreal, it's like you have this different country within a country. Montreal is a great city. It's a beautiful city. The accent is a bit, uh, the French Canadian accent, sort of uh, the side of your mouth. There, like, it's sort of, it's a little bit uh, harsher than the, than the Parisian France. Paris is very, very soft in Paris. Canada's sexiest city is Montreal and the province, uh, La Belle Provence. They're having a tough time right now there with, uh, with COVID. Mm. That's a shame. So, yeah, I, I, I love Montreal. I spent many years in Vancouver. Again, uh, my favorite Canadian city is Kelowna, British Columbia. Mm. So I shall have to stick with that. <laughs> mm. Well, David, it's been a pleasure interviewing you. Likewise, I hope I didn't go off on too many tangents. I tend to do that. You know, that's just the way I am. Uh, again, it just reminds me of how good James Arnold Taylor is <laughs> and how, <laughs> how mediocre. <laughs> Hang my head in shame. I need to take some lessons from him. Thanks very much for your time, David. Thanks, buddy. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye.